you know, like I have to say, it was really exciting to be in a Hi everyone. Uh, do you want to take your seat? Hello everybody. We have uh, many more people signed up for this, so I suspect people will just keep trickling in, and we'll just we'll just keep uh, keep charging up. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Howard Shalowitz. I'm the artistic director of the Woolly Mammoth Theater Company in uh, here in Washington D.C. Um, and um, I'll introduce my fellow uh, panelists in a moment. But if you're anything like me, uh, your blood runs a bit faster when you think about the premiere of Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring in 1913, which nearly caused a riot in the theater because of its propulsive musical rhythms and the barbarity of Majinsky's choreography. Or maybe you get a thrill of excitement when you think about reactions that first greeted the paintings of Robert Rauschenberg or the photography of Robert Mapplethorpe, the comedy routines of Dick Gregory, or nowadays Leslie Jones. Uh, let's close that. Uh, or, <laughs> or, thank you. Close that, please. Um, or some of the plays of Jean Claude Van Italy or Amira, Amira Baraka because of their shocking violence, or the early works of Susan Laurie Parks because of their strange sifting through layers of history, or even the musical Hair because of its use of nudity on Broadway. Um, these works of art live within what I like to call the zone of provocation, that range of art which runs the risk of offending some people for the sake of stretching the boundaries of expression, stirring up debate on urgent topics, or speaking truth to power. These are not the only goals of art, but historically they have been among the more important goals of art, and they have often been identified with its breakthrough moments. Our goal for the next 90 minutes is to talk about the zone of provocation in the American theater today. We'll hear from some of the creators and producers of three fairly recent projects that aroused significant controversy. We'll try to understand their intentions, um, their decision making, how they manage the public dialogue around these projects, and what conclusions they drew for the future. In our short 90 minutes, there will also be time for some of you to share additional examples, I hope, so I encourage you to think of them. And finally, I hope we can leave some time to talk more broadly about whether the zone of provocation is shrinking or expanding currently, and whether there's anything we could or should do about it. Um, I gave a speech on this topic at Ohio State a couple of years ago, and maybe just a couple of points um, can help us frame our discussion. Uh, my thesis, and it was hardly original, was that the zone of provocation is under attack, uh, both in the United States and around the world, from forces that come from both the right and the left side of the political spectrum. Um, from the right, this attack most often takes the form of trying to reduce funding for the arts in general or for specific organizations, uh, forcing arts leaders from their jobs, or imposing censorship either overtly or indirectly. From the left, this attack generally takes the form of seeking to impose standards of political correctness by labeling institutions or works of art as unrepresentative or inauthentic or insensitive to particular groups, and thereby trying to dissuade others from attending or supporting them. As we witness today the continuing polarization of our nation and our world, the rise of anti-immigrant nationalism, and simultaneously the spread of phenomena such as trigger warnings on college campuses, there is every reason to believe <laughs> that, this is not a hard prediction, that both of these forces from the left and right will continue to grow in the near future, and that artists and art institutions may have an even trickier time navigating within the zone of provocation should they choose to do so. I'm especially interested in how the fear of backlash from either the right or the left operates within the minds of writers or artistic directors as they make decisions about what plays to create or to produce. And while we don't have any overt censorship in the United States, 
what kind of internal censorship happens because of our concerns about what board members, funders, subscribers, or audiences may think. If we retreat from the zone of provocation, I wonder if we run the risk of narrowing the footprint of theater within the larger discourse of our nation. Or conversely, do we need to avoid the zone of provocation so we can protect the footprint of theater within our society? <laughs> Two very different ways of thinking about the question. Um, so these are some thorny issues I'd like you to think about during our discussion today, and I encourage you to be as honest and candid as possible so that we can really learn from one another's experiences and ideas. So now, I want to introduce the members of our panel. Um, to my left is Lindsay Albaugh, who is the associate producer at the Center Theater Group in Los Angeles, where she recently produced Sheila Callahan's Women Laughing Alone with Salad, which we'll discuss. Um, to my far left, Jack Ruler is the artistic director of the Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis, and Nataki Garrett, to his right, was the director of that theater's production of Brandon Jacobs Jenkins' play, Neighbors, and some of you, I think, also saw Nataki's production of Brandon's play, An Octoroon, uh, which is running right now at Holy Mammoth. Nataki's also on the theater faculty at Cal Arts, where she's associate director of the Center for New Performance. And to my right, um, Ari Roth is currently the artistic director of the Mosaic Theater here in Washington, D.C., but he was formerly the artistic director of Theater J, where he produced the world premiere of The Admission by the very noted Israeli playwright Moti Lerner, who uh, we're so happy could join us today from uh, Israel. Um, and I would point out that no less than seven of Moti's plays have been produced by Ari, either at Theater J or at Mosaic, all of them provocative. Um, so let's welcome all of, all of these folks. So we've chosen these three projects because they represent three very different kinds of provocation, and any one of them might raise objections from the right, the left, or both, <laughs> probably both. Um, and all of them certainly present rather specific challenges to any theater which chooses to produce them. So um, let's start with you, Lindsay. Can you give us a, a taste of Sheila Callahan's play, Women Laughing Alone with Salad, and tell us a little bit about the challenges you faced in deciding to produce it at CTG? Yes, thank you, Howard. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little context about the play for those of you who don't know it. Um, Sheila Callahan is somebody that we um, know very well and moved to Los Angeles and oh, attended our writer's workshop. So this is a group of nine writers that we invite every year to write brand new plays in our workshop. Um, and she began writing Women Laughing Alone Salad in, in, in that workshop. So we uh, were there for the very first pages of it. Um, she was inspired to write this play uh, based off a meme, uh, which is that typical meme when you see a woman laughing, hysterically eating with salad on her fork, you know? <laughs> She's so thin and attractive and she eats salad. Uh, and this, this, this marketing tool that is used in works uh, to you know, market to women about that if you eat salad or you eat healthy or you go to yoga, you will be thin and attractive and everyone will want to be you or want you. So there's a whole blog dedicated to this. So she was inspired by this meme and basically the meme came to life. These women came to life out of, out of these uh, memes and uh, what was interesting about the play is it was done from the point of view of a man. And uh, and the women in his life. So it really addressed body image, um, beauty, uh, and, and gender roles. And then uh, in act two, some of the women uh, end up playing men, and the men play women. So it uh, has a, almost a very Carol Churchill kind of feeling to it in the second act. Uh, extremely uh, vulgar, offensive language. And uh, extremely vulgar and offensive sex acts on stage, uh, masturbating, Orgies, uh, so you know, a fun play to read. We got in our office, and so I remember reading it and and being shocked in a good way, where I was like, this, I have not heard women speak like this on stage before, um, uh, and and Sheila's voice is so um, is so her own, so to speak. And so I was reading the play, and there was the men in my office, like you guys, you know, we should all read this play, and we all read it, and we thought. Can we, can we actually produce this at Center Theater Group? Yes. Uh, this large organization um, with a very large subscriber base and donor base and board members, and are we going to shock them and offend them a little too much? And eventually it came down to uh, what we thought the play was and why, why we were gonna produce it, which was um, that Sheila was pointing out these sort of marketing tactics and what it meant to be um, 
a woman or a man, and the way that you're marketed to, and that they are obscene and offensive, that sometimes these ads and the way we're marketed to are obscene. So therefore, why not use obscene and vulgar language to shock or wake the audience up and make them think, oh, I can't believe they're saying this. And if you really look at those ads, you go, I can't believe they're marketing to us this way. So anyways, um, I thought we'd read a little tiny excerpt um, from the show. I'm not a performer, and I think you are going to try this. Um, uh, Howard's going to read the part of Guy, and I'm going to read the part of Meredith. And this is uh, in a bar. We're in a bar. Yeah, it's a pickup scene, sort of. And imagine that I am a uh, curvy, voluptuous, beautiful woman. Okay. <laughs> is she skinny? Yeah. Like how skinny? Like so skinny people worry about her. Is she so skinny I can shove her entire body up my ass without any lube? You want to shove my date up your ass? Yes, I do, okay? Because I'm tired of pretending to be something I'm not. Civilized. Don't make me civilized, person whose name I don't know yet. I don't want to be your girlfriend. I want to fuck your girlfriend while you watch. I want to make her come harder and louder than you ever could. I want you to fear me. I want you to fear you fearing me. I want to lead with my mass. I want the gravity of my circumference to suck you and everyone you love into me. And I want you to stick there against my body like a suction cup. <laughs> It gets, it gets worse. Okay, yeah. <laughs> the tamer moment in the play. So, so as we decided to do this play, um, which was, I think, a big sort of risk, it felt like a big risk for us, but something that we felt really, it was important for us to do. And um, so there were preparations that I think that we, that took place at Center Theater Group. We, um, we definitely made sure uh, in our marketing and in our email communication with our subscribers um, what the show was based upon, who Sheila was as a writer, and that this would be a provocative play. And we um, often will sometimes give our plays ratings, you know, like what, what kind of, how that's old should you that's be? That's your trigger warning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like is it NC-17, you know? So, so we'll, we try, you know, and, it's, and the, the funny thing is you can do all of that and it's, you're not guaranteed that you're, anyone's gonna read it. You know, you can send those emails, you can try to put that in your marketing copy, and all day, sometimes what we hear is, oh, I saw the ad and it looked like a funny play, and I was it's so insulted and shocked, and, but we try, you know, we try to do our very best to, to um, prepare the audience. Uh, but I think more importantly, uh, after preparing them is then the, the follow-up, what happens afterwards. And so something that we've been doing, um, and I think very successfully so far, is having talk acts after every show, um, we have uh, what we call uh, uh, our audience engagement and concierge program. Is that for every play or just for every, this? Every play. Oh, we're right. doing it um, at, the, at the Kirk Douglas Theater. We have three theaters. At the Kirk Douglas Theater, we're doing it at every performance. Um, <coughs> unless it's like a David Mamet play and you can't do that. Uh, and, and then at the Taper, we're starting to um, do it as well. So, so we have a highly trained staff. I think one of our Tom Bermisters here, he helps lead this program. Um, for us, and we have highly trained staff that not only are there at the beginning of the play to uh, have uh, conversations with the audience, and they um, they carry their iPads and they also send out reports at the end of the night of conversations that they've had. But then they have, several of them are trained to read these talkbacks at the end of every show. So we do it in our lobby. We we have a bar. We try to make it very conversational and less about um, an expert leading um, a talkback and more about a conversation amongst the audience. So we allow people who are really um, perhaps offended or they don't know what they just saw or they want to talk about it, they can have a space to talk about it. But also particularly, that's something we do for every play, but on this play, our director was Neil Keller, who's an associate artistic director. And I think it was very helpful to have a staff member direct the play because he was so present and available for anything that might have come up um, all throughout the run. And so he wrote this really beautiful response uh, that could be used for anyone who, who wrote complaints, and we got quite a few. Um, and he wrote this really beautiful response as an artist, why he was drawn to direct this play, and why we felt it was important to stage this play. And we understood and we heard that people would be insulted um, by the vulgarity that they were seeing on stage, but there was a reason why. And so we were able to use his words um, and reach out to any, anyone who sent us that, those sort of letters. Did, did you, I thought you said you brought a couple of letters along. I did. Do you, do you want to share one? Is there one you can share? There's a, there, I have one here that I thought you might enjoy. Um, so I, so we, we do audience surveys at the end of every show. I'm sure many of you do that.
that as well. And uh, it's pretty extensive. And I just wanted to, to point out, I have like 70 pages here that I just, not which I'm not gonna, but just so I could refresh myself. Um, and it was very interesting to see uh, the comments uh, about the play. And, and just keep in mind that on the surveys, for us at least, that primarily the people who respond are subscribers, older white women. That a large majority, I think it was 67% were, yeah, were white women who were subscribers. So we always have to take that into account when we're looking at that kind of feedback. Our single ticket buyers, there's less um, information in there from those people who chose to come see the play. And one of the questions on the survey is, why do you come to the theater? You know, what makes you, what makes you want to even come? Now, the highest answer is, I'm a subscriber. The second highest answer is to see something new. And so I always think that's really interesting that to see something new, and, and, but they're so, they're so offended and insulted by uh, a blue job on stage. Um, okay, so this says uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let me preface by saying that I invited my daughter-in-law and her mother to what I thought would be, to what I thought would be a ladies' fun night out <laughs> to a somewhat edgy feminist work. Instead, what we experienced was immediate and continual bombardment of over-the-top, explicit, bordering pornographic, sexual language, graphic and vulgar physical enactments of sexual acts, all which did not lend itself to art. We chose to leave the intermission as a result of what essentially was an assault that showed no sense of story at all. Much to my dismay, it was traumatizing for my poor, open-minded daughter-in-law. <laughs> Many others walked out before intermission, and we assume based on the audience reaction at intermission as well. Maybe things get more lineated in the second half, but we doubt that. It seems that at least 80 to 90 percent of this play was written and performed for nothing less than shock value. A really gifted writer does not need to constantly and incessantly, incessantly use the terms "come, fuck, blowjob, sucking dick, swallowing the book." And it's all hard to say that in the conference. Uh, sexual intercourse to make the written essence of a truly great play connect with the audience. I'm not sure what to make of this, but I needed to voice my disappointment in your choice of selection. We have a wall of anything out of Bully Oh, do you? Love to read. Um, just uh, really quickly to wind up, Lindsay. So what, uh, you know, what conclusions did you come to? So you went through quite a bit of pushback and and I'm sure people who love the play and people who really hated the play. Um, but where, where, how do you think it influenced you as a theater in, for the future? I, I will say um, we were really proud we did it. <laughs> we, we felt like it was very risky. We were all very nervous throughout the entire um, pre-production and production. And, and despite the um, pushback we got from our audience, we, it solidified our commitment to, to being artists first and not um, placating a subscriber base. And, and part of what our mission at the, especially at the Kirk Dubs, but across you know, CTG, is pushing those boundaries and bringing new work to the stages. And, and what that means is that we're gonna piss people off sometimes, and it's okay. Michael Ritchie, our artistic director, will often say, you know, if, if somebody is so offended that they leave, they, that they decide to cancel their subscription, that's okay, because what if a couple of those single ticket buyers came and said, I just saw something and I can't believe what I saw and I have to come back. And those are the subscribers that we're, that we're hoping to, to gain or just repeat audience. So it's just a shift in thinking about, about who, what your allegiance is to. Is it to your subscriber base or is it to the art? Is it to yourself as artists and what you believe in? And, and it's a tricky thing in a large institution because that is a fine balance. We can't just piss everybody off all the time. We have, we have a count, we count on those subscribers. So it's a, it is a tight one. And I think you said it may affect sort of the balance of tonality next season. In other yes. words, if you go overboard one season, you might balance the next. Yeah, so I, I, did, I did mention, so last season we did a couple plays that were really out there for our audiences. And I think we pushed them more than we had ever pushed them before. So we did Salad, we did a show called Kansas City Choir Boy. I don't know if any of you know that's Courtney Love piece. Um, I don't know to describe it, but it was uh, very, I think, uh, really outside the box for our audience. And then the object lesson by Jeff Sobel, where we really transformed the theater. It was just less of a narrative and more of an um, experience. And so when we were looking at season planning for this coming season, there was a, a play that I was really passionate about that um, fit uh, in, I, I, uh, fit in with um, this Women Laughing Little Salad theme. And we just decided that we had put our audience through a lot. 
and that we worked on a program that, and 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 not because we it, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily because we were scared of losing the audience, but we just felt like okay, let's balance it a little bit more. And we're still doing some really beautiful risky work, but th that play might have pushed them a little too much. Yeah, no, these questions of balance in relation to giving offense uh, or or befuddlement for yeah. some people. Um, <laughs> They're, they're really come with us. Um, well, great, thank you so much. Um, so we're just gonna get these three stories and, and then open it up to you all to talk. So um, uh, Jack and Nataki, let me turn to you um, to talk a little bit about um, Neighbors by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, which I think many of you know is Brandon's kind of breakout play in a way. It's only had a few productions to date. Do you wanna just uh, tell us that story and what, what the kind of struggles were in deciding to do it and you can talk as a director putting your putting your stamp on. First I guess we should we should describe it. Um, is that yeah. 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 Uh, first I guess we should describe it. Um, so um, Neighbors is about a African American man um, who's married to a white woman and they have a mixed race daughter and they are from San Francisco and they moved to the Northeast to teach at one of those northeastern schools like Dartmouth maybe. And um, he's a um, a professor of uh, the Greeks. Um, I can't remember now because it's been a long time since I looked at it. The classics, thank you. Um, but I can't remember. He was. I can't remember his focus. He had actually a very specific focus. <laughs> um, and uh, so he's um, an adjunct professor at this at this uh, university, and he's trying to move up. And um, a family of big, of uh, black faced minstrels moves into the house next door. And then pandemonium ensues. Um, <clears throat> that's probably the, the most concise way of, of describing it. Yeah, I think I would add that I, I, my sense is that this minstrel family really represents every fear of his subconscious. Definitely. Well, yeah. okay, so no, the minstrel family actually represents every fear of all of our subconscious. It represents the milieu of, of black faced minstrels in, um, in American entertainment. So that's Mammy and Sambo and. Um, Jim Crow and Zip Coon and uh, Topsy uh, were all the characters. Mammy was the mother. Their father had, uh, Jim Crow Sr. had just passed away and left the insurance company for the family um, to buy a house in any neighborhood they wanted to, so they chose to move into the house next door, next door to this professor. Um, uh, and then the children are, um, Topsy's the daughter, Sambo's the oldest son, and uh, Jim Crow Jr. is the youngest son, who really doesn't want to be um, a part of this family in the way that he's being asked to. He's being asked to step into the shoes of his father. He wants to be the stage manager or do something else, do something a little bit behind the scenes. Um, and they're really pushing him forward to do this. And they come in full blackface in, in all the regalia of those, those particular uh, caricatures. Um, uh, and there's a, there's a big question about whether or not um, uh, 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 the, the lead character actually sees uh, those characters as black face minstrels because they are black people moving into the house next door, or whether or not um, they're actually just a family of, of entertainers that move into the house next door. Um, so it has to do with um, uh, a, a certain amount of self-hatred, a lack of self-reflection, this desire to move away from something in order to fit into the status quo. Um, this uh, an, an inability to be settled with who you are and how you represent yourself. Um, and it was written because um, Brendan said that a really good friend of his um, had uh, disclosed to him that he was married to a white woman. He is still married to that woman. Um, beautiful couple, I know them personally. Um, and they had never really had a conversation about race um, in the entire time that they've been married. And uh, probably still they haven't. And, the, and this particular person didn't feel it was important to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And Brandon thought, I wonder what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, you have a, a little excerpt from stage directions, I believe. I do. So I don't know sure. if, uh, if you've ever read a Brandon Jacobs Jenkins play, if you read it, the stage directions are very precise. So um, uh, because it's a long, uh, it's called an interlude. Uh, because it's a long interlude, I'm going to describe the beginning and then I'll read the rest of it. Uh, so Sambo, the oldest son, has been asked to mow the lawn. He goes to get this lawnmower. Uh, of course, because he's Sambo, he can't really quite do it right, so the lawnmower gets away from him, and he has to chase it around the stage. Um, uh, uh, he comes back, he's being chased by that lawnmower until, it's, uh, until it stops, and then it um, chases after him, grabs his skirt off, which reveals 
reveals this very large penis. Um, so I'll read from there. Um, so Sambo stands in the middle of the stage, completely naked, holding his privates. He blushes to the audience. He sees someone in the audience. He waves, moving one of his hands. And his enormous firehouse hose-esque phallus unravels from his groin and off stage. <laughs> Sambo blushes again, tries to pull it back, but it's stuck on something. Sambo works hard to pull his penis back and whatever the object is stuck on, and whatever the object is stuck on. When he finally gets back on stage, he realizes that it's broke to a watermelon. Sambo breathes. He goes up to the watermelon, tries to untie his penis from around the watermelon. Uh, he fails at the knot, frustrated. He pouts for a bit. Then he gets an idea and then proceeds to chew through the shaft of his penis. With half a penis and a watermelon, he is a success. He poses. He pats himself on the back, preens. Then he licks his lips, looks around to make sure no one is looking at him. He looks at the watermelon. He looks at uh, his half a fire hose penis, which is now, I guess, the size of a semi-normal penis, and he gets an idea. He pokes a hole in the watermelon, and then inserts his penis into the watermelon, and proceeds to make wild, passionate, savage love with the watermelon. I, I think I'm going to stop you there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's two more. He ejaculates. He pulls out. He exhausts it. He's exhausted. Then he drinks it. With the uh, cup, with the semen dripping from his face and the watermelon juice, he wipes his mouth. <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to confess something. Oh no, I, I won't do that. Go ahead. I, I was just going to confess that that you know when, when I read this, I, because it was a sensation in a kind of workshop production at the public theater, um, and then and then I want to ask Jack, you know, what it took for him to decide to do it at Neighbors, especially as the play that launched. Um, the radical hospitality regime there. Uh, but my, I, what I want to confess is that I really, the only time that I can ever remember sitting down with a playwright um, and in my office, um, and it was when I first met Brandon, and saying, uh, saying to someone, I love this play, I can't do it in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. it, it really was a play that, that for me, set the limit um, at, in, a, in a way that often wrote exactly, in some ways, it's just that one step more comfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. So even, even at William Hammond, there are limits. <laughs> I mean, I think our jobs as artistic directors of nonprofit theaters is to lead audiences to see that which they don't yet know they want to see. And we're sometimes at our worst when we ask the audience, what do you want to see or what can you handle and respond to that. That's really the mm. domain of the commercial theater. Mm. And, sometimes, and sometimes we actually can gauge the success of a play by how many people leave early. Uh, and that might be the case on this. So uh, as Howard suggested that um, in the 16 months that preceded the opening of Neighbors, Mixed Blood's board and staff had undergone a great introspection and reinvention and launched this thing called Radical Hospitality in which we demonetized the theater experience and let everybody uh, come without charge. And we made a lot of presuppositions or su suggestions to ourselves about what that might mean, one of which was that by doing that, we would go, you know, that our programming would become pablum, that we would do easy stuff that everybody could digest and we wanted to show that that wasn't quite the case. Uh, <laughs> and so we really, we started that season of, uh, it was the fall of 2011 with Radical Hospitality and Neighbors. Uh, and I had gone to, um, I had read the play, I had gotten the play from Brandon's agent. Uh, I really liked it. And then at a small theater in Kentucky, we'll talk about it. Uh, Matrix at the Matrix Theater in LA, uh, there was a production mounted, I went to see that, and my concerns about the play, quite honestly, how did you feel watching that play, were just cemented that this was a play uh, that we had to do, and we got the rights and then the array, and I was thrilled that Nataki was going to direct it, and we, um, uh, to some of the actors in town, I sent the script saying we'd love to have you come in and audition, and at that time at the Guthrie uh, Small Theater, the 200 seat theater, Pillsbury House Theater was doing one of the brother size plays, and I'd given it to one or two actors uh, in that show, and the word spread, Mixed Blood's doing the show, stay away. And there was a boycott of local actors to audition for uh, the show at the time we did it, but uh, I was actually more uh, heartened by that, and Nataki uh, was a fantastic partner, so we had to budget for a few more out-of-town actors, uh, and that's what we did, but we uh, moved forward, and. Uh, 
uh, and produced that show. One of the things in casting that we did, that the role of Mammy, we decided to cast with a man. Um, uh, anyway, it, as you can tell, it had some difficult props designer <laughs> issues. Uh, <laughs> and so, but I think what was, so, so as this night came to be, that we were opening, and so all the press about the opening of the season really was very much about the opening of radical hospitality and mixed blood reinventing itself and come and see this, uh, and very little about the play that we were opening with. We <laughs> this play by Brandon Jacob Jenkins and, um, you know, a young playwright. And, and actually there was sort of good buzz and uh, some of the people that were in it, we had some great actors in it, even the local ones that chose to do it. Uh, and so, uh, and at that day at the time we'd hoped uh, you know, the people started to line up for radical hospitality. And the audience was packed and was filled with uh, city leaders and people from our, our entire board was there and staff and family members of the cast. And we did this show and um, there's certainly when we got to the scene that Nataki just read, there was a certain exodus uh, from the theater. But what this play that you actually had to see the whole thing to be able to experience what it's about, and a lot of that happened in the last 15 minutes of the show, uh, and so Aditi, who was here tonight, was there, and uh, so the actor playing Mammy, at two hours and 15 minutes into a two hour and 30 minute show, had a heart attack on stage, and literally was dead on stage for about 20 minutes. There were paramedics in the audience and doctors, uh, and the good news is that when the paramedics, they revived him, and all we were hoping for was that all the EMTs were white because if they saw this guy in this outfit and makeup on that stage, they might not have administered care. Um, but, uh, so, but, and so nobody in the audience that night, that, that actor's wife was there, Aditi certainly took care of her, but a lot, everybody did what they did right, and the actor is back performing as an actor and director, someone we'd known for years, but all these people didn't get to see how the play ended. Um, and so as a result of that, for the neck, and, and so they all left, and we just said, come back and see the second act so you can see how the play ends, because that's an important part of your experience. <laughs> and for the rest of the run, it was a five-week run, uh, we replaced that actor as Mammy. Um, enough people left every night early to allow those that came for the second act <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, be, to be able to see how it ended and why we were doing what we were doing and what sort of uh, act of heresy this was. But uh, again, every night for every show. And Jamil Jude, if you've gotten to meet him here, uh, it was his first night with Mixed Blood as a producer in residence and as house manager. So on the first day he's house manager in charge of the audience, an actor on stage drops dead and uh, he had to manage it. But he also led this fantastic job of leading <coughs> these free forums, these post-show conversations for the every night of the run, which really you couldn't tell that people were in the same room for the same show in the two and a half hours that preceded these conversations. Sometimes the conversations after two and a half hour play were still going on for another half an hour. And it was a divide along race, there was a divide along generation. There was people from the north and south saw different plays. Um, and people, you know, normally we still do this every night we have a post show conversation. Maybe 25 to 40 people will stay depending on the show. And that, it was half the audience was staying. They had a lot to unpack emotionally after the show, artistically. Um, but uh, it was actually one of the great experiences. Uh, and I, I didn't feel like I was in the zone of provocation when we did it. I guess I've been told I was since then. Um, anyway, I think that I'll give it to Nataki to talk about the actual artistry of that. Well, and I think part of the reason why, I mean, I, uh, when I first read this play uh, with the, the uh, guy, um, uh, Joe uh, Stern in uh, Los Angeles who produced it at The Matrix, um, when he first handed it to me, he wasn't sure if he was going to do it. I had to convince him to do it. Um, and part of it was because Brandon was sort of writing that line of of conversation in my own art that I, it was like the first time I read a playwright, I read a play by a playwright, um, uh, uh, where they were actually speaking into questions that I have. Uh, I mean, directly, like, like as if I had written it myself. Um, uh, image for image, value for value, question for question, these things that, um, 
Uh, so uh, uh, the controversy of, of the play, um, uh, for me, harkens from the controversy of my existence in spaces like this. Um, that, uh, that somehow my, my uh, being a tangible human being in any kind of space is a controversy. And so the, the, um, this level of provocation uh, for me on, on this scale is just a, um, an extension of, of a level of provocation that already exists um, in spaces like these, in any space that I'm in. It's, it's um, so interesting to hear how, how close to that parallels what Lindsay said yeah. about Sheila saying she's, she's responding to the provocation that's in the world around her. Why shouldn't the play have that same, have that same level, of, level of response? Right, exactly. And the other thing is that I'm the kind of director who's interested in doing projects that feel impossible. So um, when I read it, I thought, there's no way we can do this. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and see what happens if we do it. And um, you know, I come from a long line of, uh, of, of African American, my family, African Americans who, um, for whom it's very important that we represent ourselves in a certain way so that the status quo can accept us. And in a lot of ways, I was raised to believe that I, I represent the the entire race um, of black people in the world. <laughs> um, and so the weight of that has always been heavy on me. And because of the weight of that, I've always questioned what that actually meant. Like, am I, do I represent everybody in every aspect of my life? Like when I'm doing my own thing in my own bathroom, or when I'm hanging out with friends, or when I'm having a conversation with a group of other artists in front of a group of other artists. Like, I, how, how often am I, am I um, being saddled with the weight of this? And so in a lot of ways, I feel like the play is Brandon's way of saying, yeah, me too, like I wonder how, how, how is, what is the weight of that? Um, and then the last thing is about the interludes, because that's the big thing, you know, like, the play is really um, about a family that really needs to have a conversation. Um, and, and about another family that's really trying to work through the transition post-grief of, um, of their leader, the leader of their family passing. Like if you just look at the play, that's what it is. Uh, the interludes are the play's way of, of asking how far do we go? So we laugh at the first things. We laugh like you can't get the water, the, the lawnmower to work, and you know he's kind of a bubbling idiot, and we're laughing. And then how far does it go? Like, is it this funny? Is this still funny? Am I funny when it looks like this? How deep can I make it for you before you start to question again the controversy of my existence in spaces like this? Well, I'm gonna stop you there because yeah. this is so so profound. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you guys. Um, each of these is a is a rich story that we could spend a whole panel on. Um, but let me turn over to my right, if you can just digest these one at a time, let me turn over to my right to Ari and Moti and, and ask you to, to sort of do the same and tell us just a little bit about the admission, uh, a tiny bit about the play, but also the decision, the decision to what, what you were after, Moti, in, in writing the play, because um, you're on one playwright, per se, on the panel, and then what the decision to produce it was for you. So, thank you very much, Helen. So uh, I was born in Israel, and since my early childhood, there, was, uh, there were always wars around every five years, every six, seven years, there was another war. And I grew up with hearing the narratives of these wars. And uh, as the more I grew, the more I realized that these narratives are false narratives. That the stories I hear about the wars, about what is happening to us in the wars, what is happening to the other side in these wars, this is all very, very far away from, from the reality of the wars. And there was a strong impulse. Once I realized it, and once I, re when I, once I experienced it all myself in the wars that I participated in, I felt that it is really necessary, it's crucial, it's existential, existential uh, to share the truth of the wars that I uh, know and I experienced. And uh, it seems that uh, Israel society had such a need to justify itself, to justify its wars, that uh, there was no uh, receptive audience for the truth about these wars, because the sense of justice in these wars was so uh, so fundamental in, in, in the struggle, in the struggle to survive. And <clears throat> so I was looking for uh, an example, one play I, that I Maybe some of you saw it, the production in Center State, The Better of Isaac, in 2006, it was again about the reality of war. What does it mean to be a part of the war? 
from our side, from the, 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 the side of the uh, Israeli who's caught in the war that there's no purpose and there's no uh, and, 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 and that is traumatized by it and is unable to continue his life afterwards. Uh, that the play the admission deals with uh, an event that took place in 1948 when the Israeli regiment uh, conquered the Palestinian village, and at the end of the day, about 100 or 150 Palestinians were killed, civilians. That story was suppressed. Israelis didn't know about it. Israelis refused to know about it. Uh, there was no Palestinian voice in Israel that told the story. So I felt that it is my responsibility to tell, to tell the story because I felt that the suppression of these stories, in other words, the false narrative that we create about our wars is an obstacle to reconciliation. That if we continue telling ourselves the lies that we've been told all our lives, and if we continue with these lies, uh, we won't come to any understanding with the, uh, with the Palestinians around us. The principle of truth and reconciliation that was so, uh, I think, effective in South Africa, uh, we must adopt it in order to uh, create some kind of a reconciliation uh, 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 with the Palestinians. Uh, I would like to read a little segment from the play. Uh, the play uh, focuses on a character who was the commander of the regiment who conquered that village. And uh, all his life he, 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 he lied about what happened. He said, nothing has happened. You know, we just conquered the village and that's it. And uh, he's, opposed, he's uh, confronted by his son who finds evidence to the fact that there were mass killing in that uh, village. And at the end of the play, just in the last minute of the play, he finally admits what happens. Yes. I shot too much. Yes, in rage, in revenge, in madness. Yes, we stormed the streets. Yes, I got swept away by our soldiers. I couldn't control them. Yes, I couldn't stop. Yes, we hit some who weren't armed. Yes, I hit them too. Yes, once they were just throwing stones. Maybe even some women and old, or an old men who just peeked from the windows. Yes, some who were running away. But even so, it was a battle. It was not a massacre. And two days later, there was another battle. We killed there too. We got killed there too. And then there was another one, and another one afterward. Again we killed, and again we got killed, but never slaughtered. Yes, never slaughtered. And that, the, the admission, of course, uh, is a manipulative admission. You know, this is what we did without calling the deed in, without giving it the title of a slaughter, of a massacre, of a war crime, which is very, very difficult for Israeli to admit. <laughs> the heat. Can, can, we, can we turn to Ari for right. a second and just talk a little bit just with that in our minds of what that, what that challenge was? I just want to one line uh, how, how hard the Israelis will never be able to admit the fact that they are committing war crimes. Never. I, wa I wanted to acknowledge that we're in a room full of uh, provocation practitioners. It's, uh, it's an honor to be in a room with so many uh, uh, wonderful people and to share this dais with them. And um, also to recognize we're in Washington, D.C., where this play took place. And uh, the play culminated in my termination uh, as uh, artistic director of 18 years at uh, Theater J, uh, the, a program at the Washington, D.C. Jewish Community Center. I want to recognize Mosaic staff members who are here today. I want to recognize uh, Adam Imamar, uh, the artistic director of Theater J now, and appreciate his presence here. And <coughs> to say that uh, before we talk about provocation, we should talk about the prerequisite or the, the, uh, the predicate to provocation, I believe, from an artistic point of view, which is uh, the establishment of a trust. Uh, Provocation without trust can lead you to many different kinds of harassments or inflictions of terror, uh, verbally, culturally, actually. Um, theaters are trusts uh, that's uh, dictated in their missions. I won't tell you the mission of what Theater J was or is or what Mosaic is now, but just to understand that provocation doesn't exist in the vacuum. Um, 
though a playwright with a professional debut coming out with his provocations, um, that is a particular kind of boldness because it doesn't lead with a mission statement. Theaters do. Theaters say, this is who we are and why we are gathered together. And um, to that purpose, uh, there are also some understandings about this very important charge we have of speaking truth to power or speaking satire to power. Hmm. We understand that we're rarely uh, hurling invective at the vulnerable. The satire rarely punches down, it punches up. And when it punches down, you sometimes get a Charlie Hebdo situation where you are <coughs> inflicting your provocation on those who feel tremendously threatened. In the case of the Jewish community, you have an interesting dialectic. You have power that feels threatened. In Israel, you have power that feels that it's at the brink of an existential crisis. And therein lies the controversy. But those who live in Israel and those who support Israel have to recognize that for all the security it still craves, it has a tremendous amount of security relative to those who are, be, who are living under occupation. And the need to create a reconciliation between the two demands, as exactly as Moti says, a truth-telling, a reckoning with the past, the most difficult kind of political negotiation. So Moti's play, The Admission, didn't come out of nowhere. It came from establishing years of trust with our audience and within our community about the kinds of dialogues we were going to have on our stage, intercultural encounters between Jews and non-Jews about our relative health and how we overcome the gulfs of experience that divide us. The admission was not the first Israeli play we did. It was not the first Israeli-Palestinian encounter that we had. It was one in a long line. It built on Return to Haifa, a Palestinian novella adapted by an Israeli theater company, the Kamari, that positioned Palestinian and Israeli birth, mo birth mother and nurturing mother who raised the same son, and a son who had to decide who he belonged to. Moti's play was prepared for in our community by a series of readings and then workshops, which made it an infinitely better play as he continued to, to build the play both in Israel, first under the tighter, title Dinner with Dad, and later uh, in workshops both in Israel and at Theater J. The bad thing about it is that it created a lot of interest and attention from many other onlookers, beginning with the stakeholders within our Jewish Community Center, the Embassy of Israel that had paid for Moti Lerner to come on many other occasions to the United States, that had paid for the Palestinian novella to be staged by the Kamari Theater on our stage. People knew what was coming. People knew the historian's debate that centered around the controversy of Tantura. People were paying attention to this upcoming world premiere. Uh, and so we girded ourselves for what was to happen. Uh, because of our track record of producing work about the conflict, we had also um, helped ignite the existence of a rump group, as I called them, uncharitably, a Jewish Tea Party organization, a little citizens vigilante group called <coughs> Citizens Opposed to Propaganda Masquerading as Art, Kotman. <laughs> You can look it up. They still, their website is still uh, running, uh, kapma.net. And they um, had this play in their sights, as they had Moti in their sights and me in their sights. And they uh, migrated from a fax machine and stationery with five people signed on to an e-blast courtesy of the right-wing think tank uh, uh, of some 10,000 names and addresses 
of every Jewish Federation board member and addresses of every JCC board member. So they got to terrorizing by email those who otherwise were very proud of their little Jewish theater that became a, a much bigger Jewish theater over the years. And they put a tremendous amount of maligning information, both about the play, the treatment, our intentions out to create a kind of atmosphere of invective in the room. Uh, and then we committed to produce the play. There was a boycott campaign uh, organized by Katma to get donors to withhold money from the Jewish Federation because of their support of the JCC, which enabled Theater J to program. And there was a running count of how much money was being withheld from the Federation campaign. From 5,000, do your principals have a price tag? Was the question I was asking at staff meetings. Do our principals have a price tag? At $5,000, the show went on. At $20,000, we were still committed. When there was reported to be a well, withholding of $250,000, we said, oh, wait a second, let's stop and think about this. Uh, that that uh, withholding never materialized. It wasn't a real um, withholding of a quarter million dollars, but it was out there rhetorically for a moment. And the JCC decided that they were not going to be able to produce the full production, but because we had already put the JCC to its credit, wanted to honor all the contracts of all the equity actors who were signed, of all the Israel, five Israeli artists who were already committed on board. So we were going to honor the contracts, not do the 34 performance run. With hard negotiating from our artists, we agreed to a 16 performance workshop presentation. Uh, the ensuing publicity around this compromise ensured that all 3,600 seats to that 16 performance run were sold out. Uh, we were, after rave reviews from the show, we uh, were told that we couldn't possibly extend, of course, uh, but I enlisted an outside producer, Andy Shalal of Busboys and Poets, uh, to present the show for 22 additional performances at Studio Theater, which were equally uh, popular. Uh, six months, uh, five months later, the Voices from a Changing Middle East Festival, which was 14 years running, was canceled by the JCC, and I felt compelled to protest that uh, in the press, internally, and I was fired a month later for insubordination. Um, and Mosaic Theater was born the next day. Uh, Voices from a Changing Middle East Festival continued as well. Um, just to, to move this forward, just uh, maybe to ask you one question to wind up on this. Yes. Um, what, what, how, how did that affect your thinking as you think about those mosaic for the future in, in any way, or was it, it you know, lost I think those quest, I think those questions of context and trust <coughs> are really, really important as we continue to ask urgent questions. I mean, provocation is a word that to me is just a, a descriptive of something that's more important, which speaks to mission and speaks to the urgency of what you have to say. And uh, Mosaic would do well to understand its deep mission and its deep reason for existing before it goes about provocation for provocation's sake. And, um, Knowing, as a mosaic, as a theater that's uh, running in Northeast DC and not Northwest, as a theater that's open and we, uh, it's represented by a large cohort of African American board members, that is being relevant to an African American community as well as a fusion community of Jews and non-Jews from all quadrants of the city. Um, we, we are going down the road of continued provocation but we have to build the trust first and foremost. Well, look, as I said, these are three phenomenal stories. Can we give a hand to all of you? <laughs> we're going to come back to that. We still have a good half hour left. We'll come back to all this. But I just want to turn it over to you all for just one second. 
I'm just really interested for just a few minutes if there's examples that any of you brought into the room or, or, or you know, from your own experience where you really struggled with the decision to produce or not to produce a play, to write or not to write a play, um, and sort of what the content of that struggle was and, and what you might have learned from it, but in, in really short, uh, in really short <laughs> sound bites. I, just, I don't want just these three examples, which we've sort of selected to sort of stand for every, every example. I think that provocation exists on a lot of levels, is very specific to different communities and different contexts, et cetera. So does anybody have anybody to, any to share? It's confession time, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you want? Well, you can take up there. Let's give you a mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, my name is Patrick Dooley. I'm the artistic director of a group in Berkeley called the Shotgun Players, right. and um, we uh, we're actually um, in the midst of an initial run. We're at our 25th anniversary season this year, and we we chose to do a play, um, Penelope Skinner's The Village Bike, which Say I had, again? it's called uh, The Village Bike by Penelope Skinner, and I've been following this play, and it's it's run at the Royal Court and um, moved to New York with. Uh, with great interest, and she was a playwright that I've been following for a few years, and we um, we chose to do this play. You know, it's a, again, it's a really, you know, we knew it was a controversial piece. It had not met with that same controversy in its earlier runs, um, but we we did the show. You know, it, it really tackles a lot of things of gender stereotypes and pornography, and just you know, it goes. You know, and then the female protagonist in the play. You know, make some difficult decisions that end up not working out so well for her. So we, we did the show. We worked on it actually for a few months in advance to kind of just get ourselves wrapping ourselves around it. And did the show and and then had a really exciting preview process. We're having incredible talkbacks. People really sort of inspired to see the show. Had our um, and then had the the, the uh, critic for the San Francisco Chronicle come to see the show. And for the first time in 25 years, we got what um, you guys may not know about this. There's the, the lowest rating, which is an empty chair. <laughs> now, I've never even seen any play get this, and any, it, it ever happened. This is a brand new credit to the Chronicle, and we got on the front page two pages of review, two color photos, like, do not see this play, run away from this play, not a single mention of a single actor in the show, anything else, basically just a rant about why this play should not be done or seen. Now, I mean, unfortunately, we live in a city where there is really one big paper, it's the Chronicle. There are several of the critics, but none of them matter next to this one. So it was a, you know, the next day we sold one ticket. The day after that we sold a half price ticket. Yes, now, I mean, never mind the fact that like, audiences who have been coming to the show are writing protest letters to the Chronicle, which they never printed, you know, and letters to the organization. Um, but we have just started a rally like a week and a half after this of other positive reviews coming out to turn it around. The, the other interesting thing about this season, and this is why this is relevant, and I'll wrap up really quickly, is that we were doing the season in rep, which means we do one show, then we do the second show and keep doing the first show, the third show keep doing, so we're gonna do a true season in rep, so by the end of the year we're doing five shows, uh, five different shows, five days, five different shows. I'm looking at this empty chair for the next seven fucking months. <laughs> like, how do we do this? And at one point, there was a question, like, we talked, like, well, if we show that really tanks, like, do we just hide, do we just bury that show and just do four shows? But here's the thing, we fucking love this show. And we really believe in this play. We've all done this play that so we just want to have die a nice, quiet death, but that was not this play. And, and, I, and we were starting to get this, you know, audience that's like saying, no, we want you to do this show. We're so glad, glad you did this show. Women saying, I'm so grateful to hear this story told, even though it's ugly. And even the playwright, like I'm terrified, like, oh gosh, she's gonna be so upset. But she sent people to see the show. And she, I just got this thing from her yesterday, like send me some questions, I'll answer them. And just in responding to this thing. And we're trying to figure out how do we, in the face of having the largest paper in Northern California say, do not go see this play, how do we find a way to keep it going through word of mouth? And we're starting to figure that answer out, but it's, you know, it's already had a devastating financial impact on the organization. I mean, it's just, you know, when you're selling tickets for 20 bucks a piece, it's hard to make up what, you know, is equivalent to like 20 grand in just, you know, 10 days of losses. So, that's anyway, so, that's there it is. Really yeah. uh, devastating. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Um, you need uh, this? You don't yeah. need that? <laughs> um, so, uh, Godfrey Simmons, um, Artistic Director of Civic Ensemble um, in Ithaca, New York. And um, we were doing a production, we just finished it this past spring. We did a production of Eugene O'Neill's All Guys Chillin' Got Wings. 
And uh, yeah, I see people turn around. What the fuck? Why was he doing that? <laughs> that you, if you go on, if you go on Wikipedia, you see like four productions of it, like in the world, seemingly, right? <laughs> and we did a small production of it in uh, in New York City, like kind of way off Broadway, and it, you know, it did decently. But we did a co-production with Cornell this past spring, and when we were when, when, when uh, they had asked me to direct something there and I brought up, you know, All Guys Doing Got Wings, I said, but listen, what, what we're going to do is, is that we're going to split the audience, one side white and one side black. And then everybody else got to kind of choose where they could sit. <laughs> what? Yeah. So we, now we did this in the city. Um, but what was interesting is, is that there was, what was fascinating was is that when you have institutional buy-in and you talked about trust, we were able to figure out all of the steps so that it wasn't, it, the, the adjective, the adjective came later, like kind of once it came up and I'll get to that, and I'll try to get to that very quickly. But the, the institution, Cornell was like, so what do we do with this? Well. The, you know, the, the, the population of Cornell is like 30%, you know, Asian or Asian American. How do we deal with that? And so we made certain, there were certain differences. Like we, we, we said that one side would be white and one side would be people of color. Um, and uh, instead of just saying like, you know, white and black, right? And then, um, so anyway, we go through it. Uh, we engage students in terms of um, getting the word out and talking about the production. Um, we had students actually leading the post-show conversations. So we were really trying to do everything um, very, uh, in a very engaged way, right? And then all audiences know we do shit like this all the time, that we're kind of like down the hill, and it is on a hill. Um, uh, and uh, we get to the per performance, um, the production. Opening night, the, uh, there, there, there are basically kind of two papers in town. It's Ithaca. So you're not kind of too worried about it, but it'd be great to get a good review. The two, uh, uh, so the opening night, one of the critics is, decides to sit, he's white, he decides to sit on the, uh, the person of color side, right in the center. Uh, there's no privilege there, but anyway, he, he sits right in the center and um, gets up and walks out in the middle of the second act. Yeah. So I, and I, so, and I go, I, you know, and I'm kind of, I'm freaking out a little bit because I'm like, what the, you know, and somebody was like, well, maybe he has a bad prostate. You don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, but then finally, he writes a review. Oh my God. And I knew he was going to do this shit. So he writes a review and talks about leaving the show and says the show was great. I just couldn't take it. I could not, I could not deal with it. And if you don't know the, we all probably know the play, but it deals with interracial marriage and, and, uh, it's, and it's, it's just, you know, there's bile there, there's all kinds of stuff there. And, um, and they talk to the audience a lot during it in our production. He couldn't handle it. Um, ticket sales went up. Oh. <laughs> is the is 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 the thing, but I think the criticism, the big thing about it that, that I guess that I'm interested in is how critics play a role in this as like gatekeepers and as morality police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I just want to ask a question. Yeah. I'm very very interested in the neighbor story. I mean, there is there's artistic provocation which I indulge in. You know, and try to push what an audience is ready for in terms of the form. And but it seems like in your theater jacket that it's both content and form were the provocation. And that I'm super interested in the boycott of the of the black actors and that kind of censorship, which I think mm -hmm is probably behind the Village Bike story too. I, I, I imagine it's like, don't see this play because it's not right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's showing things that in an improper way. Right. I mean, so the discomfort within the field 
of, tackle, of tackling certain kinds of projects and, and how, how we as artists kind of talk about it and censor each it's other. Like, so it's the, it's the censorship from the left and the right at the same time mm -hmm. yeah. that interests me. Could you talk about Well, I mean, I agree with Ari that the only filter I feel like we have is mission uh, mm -hmm. and how we play with content and form is the joy of being an artistic director and actually having to have, getting to have taste that you can share. Uh, I know when we did an Octoroon this year, I said to Nataki, uh, you know, this play isn't that subversive. We should be just fine with this. And she, she was just like, you have drank your own Kool-Aid too long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know if I get the question, but in, well, my uh, question I, is for Nataki, I think, mm -hmm. like, have you faced censorship from within your own African American community, the actors, not yeah, thinking it's right. Like, how do you push back or? You don't. These conversations are hard to have. I mean, we, that's why you have them secretly and not in front of, mm -hmm. not in front of the the dominant society. You have them secretly because they're hard to have, mm -hmm. um, because you're sort of forced into closure. Um, uh, and so um, it's not. I mean, when we did it in, in L.A., I had an actor come in in blackface, and we went through the whole for the audition. He auditioned in my face. Mm -hmm. And we went through the whole audition, and I, um, uh, he was visibly upset. I mean, really, really angry at me. And so I, when we went through the whole thing, he read the sides, and, and I said, do you have any questions? And he said, I want to know what you're going to do about this. And I was, you know, so we sat for a while and talked a little bit about it. And, and, um, uh, and I, you know, I understood. And I said, what I want to know is how you're getting back into your car. <laughs> That's what I want to know because I, I I understand you know it's my it's I have a mission as well um, and so I have a responsibility to what I'm doing. But how are you getting back into your car? How are you going to do that? Because you don't have the protection of this sanctuary when you walk out there like that. I, I think that's actually one of my key. If we, if we can open this up to a larger conversation now, or any more examples would be exciting too. One of my key, key questions about. Um, this, about theater in general is how do we protect that sense of a safe space um, where people are looking at the thing on the stage as a work of art, not a, a not an advocacy platform, but as something which is a Rorschach test that they're asked to re asked to respond to, whether the provocation is aesthetic or um, or political or, or civic or racial, whatever whatever the provocation is. And because I'm not, of course, we don't have everyone in our audience doesn't understand that. I think, you know, and, and every theater is different, but I think that's what I feel like. We kind of have a collective responsibility to protect that sense of we go in and do this thing together and we can live with it, but I just don't know, that, that's just not where I think our society's at about art in general. So I'm just curious how uh, you all reflect on that. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, not, I'm not Jerry, which I'm an artistic associate with the Freedom Theater in the West Bank, Palestine, and also Connecticut Repertory Theater. Um, and I'm not sure that the trust relationship can be controlled. Uh, there's always, I mean, what, if you're talking, it's not a closed system. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, the, obviously the trust within the audience and the theater is critical to the ahead, but you can't control who's going to insert themselves into that relationship beyond uh, the, the Tea Party group, as you described it, was not a part of your system, but they inserted themselves into it. Um, so you can't always tell. You know, uh, the, the, the quick example I'd like to bring is actually a wonderful play called Cambodian Odyssey by John Lipsky, which we did at the Merrimack Repertory Theater 20 years ago, about Hang Noor, uh, which many of you remember is the uh, actor who won the Academy Award for Killing Fields but whose personal story was exactly the same as Dith Pran, the character he played. And there was a scene that, that, that was in his novel, or his biography, and in the play in which a group of Cambodians come across some Khmer Rouge at the end of the revolution and kill them with signs that say, Khmer Rouge, enemy forever. Well, Lowell, Massachusetts, as it happened, was like the second largest Cambodian refugee population, which is why we were in the play. And the consultant for the play was from the community, and the community found out about the scene and were outraged and wanted the scene cut. And John, the playwright, actually 
Well, they're right. It, 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 it destroys the capacity or it attacks the capacity for reconciliation within the community. But the rest of us felt very strongly it should stay because it was Hangar's story. It was his story. It was his wife who was killed. It was his child who was killed. It was he who survived. But the Cambodian community was like, that's just karma. Why, why is he special about that? In fact, that's what they said. And so there was a huge struggle within the artistic community of this play about whether to listen to the community that was asserting itself for their own political purposes or not. And actually, we decided to keep the scenes, to some extent, against John's preferences. So you know, it's a, it's a complex problem that, doesn't, that, that looks at both sides of community and Jason. Sometimes the artist's got to stand up for the community. Right. Jason. Well, just some, I, like, no, I'm, I'm all on this side. I'll move to this side next. Sorry. Just hearing all the stories and thinking about a positive of all of this, we tend to think of theater as a medium that can't reach people as easily as others. But the fear that's engendered in people actually sort of is an indication of power to voice. Oh. And just, just thinking about the that. The test of provocation is that you actually, exactly. well, yeah, <laughs> people, people are, you do, you achieve your and, Well, yeah, and then it sucks that people are so scared of their representation for all sorts of cultural reasons that anything that could be perceived as negative is incredibly terrifying. It reminds me, and I clearly wasn't there, but the original God of Vengeance production in Broadway that had the first lesbian kiss on Broadway history and got shut down because years ago, like Jewish community didn't want that to be the representation even though it was from their culture. But the idea that we can still reach people on that fundamental level and that people are so scared of how people will, will be perceived by our medium actually in some ways is empowering about the voice that we still have. Well, thank you for reminding us that I intended this to be an inspiring panel. <laughs> yeah, it just seems like there's a lot of power there. Uh, I, I just want to interject part of my The only show I've ever walked out of was at Woolies. Yeah, I'm sure. It was at uh, Southwest <coughs> Africa. The, I think there's we are South proud. We are proud to present. Thank you. We're proud to present. It wasn't because I didn't want it. It was hard to say I like or not like or something like that. It's because I was so angry. I wanted to kill white people. <laughs> and I'm not a violent person. But you didn't want I to feel those feelings. I couldn't yeah. be in the room any longer with that rage that it mm -hmm. awoke in me, which actually then kind of, in retrospect, what it did was remind me of how angry I am all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and how I, so much of my life as, a, as an African American of a certain generation, in particular, has been about dampening that down, mm -hmm. making it go away, mm -hmm. find other ways to express yourself so that, that you know I don't feel like I'm silenced, but that I you know I'm not I've never been empowered either in any mm -hmm. other way other than working creatively to speak about things that I'm angry about and 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 um, second part of that was oh I loved. This show, Brandon's show, because I felt like for the first time, there it all is on stage. And it was funny, and it was potent, and it was angry, and all and it told this wonderful story, and the fact that it ends up with those two black women standing on stage talking about this shit. You know, it was because that was a, I have a poem they wrote one point, point the end of it is, put my book about a maid, I'm creating this character, Beulah the maid, uh, and that Beulah's last line is because it, her, her motto is, sick of this shit, mm. and she walks out. But there it was, <laughs> so thank you. I'm no, and you put your finger on something. I mean, Brandon is particularly effective at using humor to disarm our defenses yeah. about the offensive things then that he puts in front of us, and of course humor is just a great tool yeah. that way. Uh, Jackie's play, a, a brilliant play, but it's is just kind of bringing you it's right just into it. Just like, yeah. And it's too, it's so many years too late to like, even do something about mm -hmm. the issues in that particular play. And these responses are very personal. I mean, different people respond differently. Yes. Yeah. Um, so my name is Shay, and I'm a, um, an actor and a writer, and, and I perform on big stages and small. 
Guthrie to small Frederick Theater, et cetera. Um, but I'm also a curator and, um, and often am charged to sort of incubate new projects and, and, and also sort of be the steward behind uh, projects that provoke, projects that um, are just finding their voice. And some things really resonate for me. One is, um, the yeah, what is the trust contract that you're, you're building? And, the, and what happens in the absence of that, particularly around community response and how a community can feel like they're not brought along. Um, I'm also curious of, about the sacred space that's created, not just in the room, but yeah, again in the community and also the ripple effect. Because you think after once that play lands and you know the immediacy of it is gone, what happens after that? And who's in the responsibility? Um, and I, so as a curator, I want to just bring up two situations. So one was, um, so a small organization that I work with, Intermedia Arts, um, 118 seats, invested in an artist over 60 who wanted to put a story on stage. The story was, um, Angry black women and well, angry black woman and well-intentioned white girl. And she wrote this piece and uh, she wanted to just throw it up on stage. And we really realized that we needed to do, she was getting, it, originally the project had six months and we added eight months onto that in order to grow the understanding around why this piece is happening on stage and what are we actually trying to do. And realized that it was a, a bigger responsibility to, to own that story, and the show sold out two and a half months in advance. Um, three shows were added, um, and her next piece is called um, Old People's Pussy. But <laughs> 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 it really, and, and it's really, and, and yeah, two ticket sales went up, you know. <laughs> I think that point about building the trust while you're building the peace, or almost almost like those are two parallel tracks, is very interesting. Um, when I, when, you know, we premiered when we were Laughing Alone with Salad just a little bit before CTG did it at Woolley, and I lost sleep over that. I really thought people would think it might just be smut. Um, and I think I felt okay because at a very, at, when I knew I would, was, would be okay, is at a very early reading of the play. We invited a whole bunch of board members. We said, let's get out in front of this and let's invite some of our closest in stakeholders, uh, especially women, because the piece was sort of pitched at, uh, at women in the audience, um, to, to listen to this right away. And, and immediately I just knew, I, I felt, uh, you know, when you immediately take that step of not holding the decision as a secret and not asking other people necessarily what they think, I, I, I'll never do that, it's just not in my DNA to do that. But then saying, this is what we're committed to, help, you know, help me understand what we've got here, and seeing how robust the conversation was. The first time we just did a reading of the play, I just felt, oh, okay, <coughs> this is gonna be okay. This, is, this really is a genuine conversation. Yeah. Um, this, you just brought up something I've been thinking about listening to all of you guys. When we did, um, when we did our production of Salad, we had already seen, we came to see the world premiere of Bully, which was really helpful to us. Um, when we had decided to do it, I don't know that we knew we were going to do it at the time. When Willie decided to do it, we were like, oh, thank God. <laughs> you know, we, we were so excited to be able to go see it. And, and um, I just am wondering, as we all talk about this, uh, something that I thought a lot about since Salad closed was what, what, if anything, could we have done better uh, or differently with our audience and our mm. staff and our board to prepare them? And we tried. I mean, we thought we had our bases covered, and I don't know that we fully did. And, and just to, to, to spark that conversation off, if anyone has any thoughts on that, I will say one thing that, ha uh, that I thought of was our staff. I think sometimes the artistic staff will make a decision and will hold that decision right here. And because we all feel like we, we know what that decision is.